Well, hello, Saddleback. I'm really glad you're here this weekend. Have I told you lately that I love you? It's good to see you. Didn't we have a great Mother's Day last weekend? A really, really great weekend. I want to say hi to all of our campuses. Hello, San Clemente. Hello, Rancho Capistrano. Hello, Laguna Woods. Hello, Irvine, Huntington Beach, Corona, Anaheim, Los Angeles, Hong Kong, Berlin, Manila, Buenos Aires, and everybody else. <laughs> we, we love you very, very, very much. Uh, this weekend, I'm uh, at, uh, at uh, Saddleback uh, Los Angeles because it's the one month anniversary of that church. Uh, we're meeting there in the Palladium, the iconic Hollywood Palladium on Sunset Boulevard and I'm very excited about that. If you'll take it on your message notes, this weekend we return to our series that I'm calling The Keys to a Blessed Life. And we're looking at the eight Beatitudes of Jesus as we go through the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse. Now the fact of life is that life is tough. Everybody agree with that? It's not easy. Life is tough. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Since Adam sinned, the world was broken and everything on the planet is broken. Nothing works perfectly. I've said this many times. Your body doesn't work perfectly. The weather doesn't work perfectly. We've been in fires all this week. The economy doesn't work perfectly. No relationship works perfectly. Your marriage doesn't work perfectly. And life is full of losses. We have defeats and we have disappointments. This is not heaven. That's why we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven there are no defeats, there are no, no disappointments. But on earth, nothing works perfectly all the time. So we have trials and tribulations, we have sorrow and we have suffering, we have problems and pressures, we have, as I said, defeats and disappointments. Now how do you rise above the inevitable losses in your life? How do you rise above them? Well, today we come to the second beatitude. It's Matthew chapter five, verse four, and Jesus says this. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, in the eight ways to be blessed by God, the second way, this seems so ludicrous when you think about it, so unnormal, so irrational when he says, the way to be blessed is to mourn. What in the world does he mean by that? In other words, the way to be happy is to be sad? That, that just seems like a great reversal. What does he mean by this? God blesses those who mourn. Well, that's what we're gonna look at this weekend on how to handle the losses of life and how God blesses a broken heart. Now, I don't know what you're going through right now. I hope you're going through a relatively easy time, but you may not. Some of you came to service this weekend all churning inside. You've got conflicts, you've got chaos, you've got a bad health report, you just got laid off, you've had a fight with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, there, there are, the money isn't there where you need it, and, and you're under tension, and many people watching online right now, there are, there are things, you've had a, a loss in your life, or you've had a death in your life, or if you had something that has caused you to have grief. Now, this last year, as you know, I, I've gone through a, a year-long journey with grief since Matthew died. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about grief that I didn't even know a year ago. And what I wanna do this weekend is just kinda of summarize a few of those ideas. I think someday I'll probably write a book on it because I've learned so much about it. But I wanna just give you a few things on how to be blessed in a broken world. Now. Let me, let me give you a couple things. Write these down. Here's just a couple of insights before we actually get into it. One of them is this. God doesn't expect me to be happy all the time. 
That's just a fact of life. God doesn't expect you to be happy all the time. There's this myth that Christians, if you're a believer, if you know Jesus, you should be always smiling, always happy, always cheerful, skipping the hills and picking flowers and talking about peace and love. No, that's rainbow bright, not a Christian, okay? And when you become a follower of Jesus, it doesn't mean you become a Pollyanna or an Annie, little orphan Annie, and the sun will come up tomorrow and it's always up, up into the pool and you're always happy. No, no you're not. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time for everything. There's a time for everything. And there's a season for every activity under heaven. In other words, life is a series of, of um, opposites. There's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. And so uh, the Bible says that uh, sometimes weeping is appropriate, sometimes mourning is appropriate, uh, sometimes grieving is appropriate, because the fact is the world is filled with a lot of sadness. Uh, all you have to do is read the paper and read about little girls getting kidnapped and fires and murders and wars and all kinds of things. There's a lot of pain on this planet. And sometimes the only appropriate logical response to life is grief. God doesn't expect you to simply grin and bear it, to stuff your emotions, and to smile in the middle of all of the storms of life. No, in fact, the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn. God blesses you when you grieve. Why? Why does he do that? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. Now, a lot of people think that grief is only for funerals. Like, you know, if you lose a loved one, uh, then, then you grieve. But the fact is, there are a lot of losses in life. There are thousands of losses. You can lose your health, you can lose your job, you can lose your money, you can lose your reputation, you can lose your energy, uh, you can lose a dream. There are thousands of different losses in life. And God says, the only appropriate response to the losses of life is not to fake it, but to face it. And not to go around grinning, but to actually grieve. There's a time for every activity under heaven. I actually went through a, a study this week of what the Bible says we're supposed to mourn and grieve. And uh, I'm not gonna get into that, that would be two or three sermons, but the Bible says I'm, I'm to mourn my losses, which is um, things, bad things that happened to me. And the Bible says I'm to mourn my disappointments, which are good things that didn't happen to me. Did you hear that? Good things that didn't happen to you, that's a reason to mourn. The Bible says I'm to mourn my sins, and that I'm to grieve over my sins. The Bible says I'm to grieve and mourn over the suffering in the world, and not be, you know, blasé about it. The Bible says I'm actually to grieve for my friends who don't know Jesus, who are spiritually lost. And there are a lot of things the Bible tells us to grieve over, but God doesn't expect you to be happy all the time. Second thing, write this down, is that grief is essential to my health. Grief is essential to my health. It's essential to my emotional health, to my spiritual health, to my physical health, and to my mental health. In fact, if you never grieve about anything, if you're never sad about anything, it means one of three things. A, you're out of touch with reality, because there's a lot of things to be sad about in this world. Uh, or, or B, you are out of touch with your own emotions and you're living in denial. Or C, you don't love. Because when you love and you see sad things, that makes you grieve. Now grief is a painful emotion, but it's a healthy emotion, and it's a helpful emotion. And it is God's gift, it's the tool that God gives us to get through the transitions of life. I, I've told you this before, there is no growth in your life without change. You can't grow without change. There is no change without loss, because you lose some of the old for the new. There is no loss without pain, and there is no pain without grief. To go through life without grieving would be like uh, a, a mother who says, I wanna have a baby without going through the pain of labor. It isn't gonna happen. It isn't gonna happen. Now, there are two unhealthy reactions to the losses of life. 
One is repression and the other is suppression. Repression is when I conscious, unconsciously try to block a painful thought out of my mind. That's repression. I unconsciously try to block a pain, painful thought out of my mind. Suppression is when I consciously try to block a pain, I'm not gonna think about that, I'm not gonna think about that, I'm not gonna think about that. When I consciously try to block a painful thought out of my mind, both of these are denials. When you go through a tough time, when your heart is hurting, when your heart is breaking, God doesn't want you to suppress it. God doesn't want you to repress it. God wants you to express it to friends and confess it to him. And when you do that, you're on the road to healing. Now, I want you to write this down. If I don't let it out, I will act it out. If I don't let it out in healthy ways, I'm gonna act it out in unhealthy ways. Some of you were hurt many years ago growing up. Maybe your parents divorced. Maybe you were abused. Maybe you were hurt by something somebody said about you. And it hurt very, very deeply. But as a child, you didn't know how to grieve healthy. You didn't know how to grieve good. So you just pushed it down and you stuffed it down and you've never grieved over that hurt. Well, you need to go back and grieve over it. Why? Because if you don't grieve the losses of life, you get stuck at that stage. Let me say that again. This is one of the most important things you're ever gonna learn. When you don't grieve, when you don't go through grief and a pain, when pain happens in your life and you don't let it, you don't, you don't feel it, you, don't, you push it down, you get stuck emotionally at that stage and you spend the rest of your life reacting to something that happened a long time ago and you're taking it out on the people around you now and that's not fair. It's unhealthy to stuff it. You've heard me say this before, when I swallow my grief, my stomach keeps score. If I don't talk it out, I take it out on my own body or on other people. And if I don't let it out in healthy ways, then I'm gonna act it out in unhealthy ways. And when you swallow negative emotions, your body gets sick. Now I've said many times, it's not just what you eat, it's what eats you that makes you sick. David talked about this in Psalms. Notice on your outline, David says in Psalm 32, verse three, when I kept things to myself, I felt weak deep inside me, and I moaned all the day long. Now circle the word moan. When you go through a loss in life, you lose a job, you lose a friend, you lose a deal, you lose something in your life that you were hoping would happen or something you had and you lost it. You lose a marriage. You can either mourn or you can moan. Moaning is negative, mourning is positive. Moaning is having a pity party. Mourning is calling out to God in your grief and in your pain. Psalm 39, verse two, David says, I was silent and I held my peace to no avail and my distress only grew worse. If you don't grieve the losses in your life, if, you, if you're too busy and you just have to stuff it, I can't think about it. You try to do the Clint Eastwood, you know, strong silent type or just grin and bear it and you press on and you don't even stop to mourn a loved one's death. If you don't do that, then what happens is, he says, my distress only grew worse. So what am I saying? The things that happen to you, around you, the bad things that happen to you, they're not your choice. But grief is a choice. And it's a healthy choice. And when you choose to let it out, you have to choose to allow yourself to feel the sad emotions. You say, well, I don't like feeling sad. No, you don't, but not everything that's helpful feels good. Not everything that's healthy feels good. If you don't mourn the losses of life, you get stuck at that stage. Now this weekend, what I want us to look at is how God blesses broken hearts. Because the second beatitude, Jesus says this, God blesses those who mourn. Now, I want God to bless your life. I want God to bless your life in spite of all the bad things that have happened and in spite of all the bad things that are gonna happen. And in order for God to bless your life, 
Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. How does God comfort me when I grieve? I'm an authority on this one. After this last year, I can speak from experience on how God comforts. And as I've looked back over my life in the last year, I see six ways that God blesses a broken heart. Since Matthew died, I have cried every single day since he died. That's not a sign of weakness, that's a sign of love. Deep love cares. Deep love is strong. So how do you get through? You don't get over it. A lot of people think, well, I'm just gonna get over this grief. No, you're not gonna get over it. If it's serious, if you're married for a certain number of years and then you divorce, you don't get over it, you get through it. If you have a loved one, a husband, a wife who dies, you don't get over that, you get through it. Now, you can't go over grief, you can't go under grief, you can't go around grief, you gotta go through the grief. And if you're scared to express emotion and you refuse to go through it, that, as I said, that's where you get stuck. But how do I get unstuck? You let God help you, let God comfort you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And how does God comfort us? Six ways, write these down. Number one, the first way God blesses a broken heart is God draws us close to himself. He draws us in close to himself. Look at these verses, Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. When you are grieving, you often feel like God's a million miles away, but he's not a million miles away. He's never been any closer. What you feel and what's real are not the same thing. Not everything you feel is real and not everything that's real do you feel. The Bible says God is close to the brokenhearted. He's paying attention. He's not aloof, he's not distant. Hebrews 13, five, I will never leave you. Circle that, never. That means even in your worst pain. It means even in your most embarrassing disgrace. It means even in your most massive failure, even in the thing you're most ashamed of in your life. I will never leave you and I will never abandon you. And 2 Corinthians 6.10 says this, our hearts ache, but at the same time, we have the joy of the Lord. What does that mean? That's the difference Jesus makes. If you don't have Jesus in your life, then God isn't close to you at that moment, and you're you're on your own. You don't have any other resources. You're there to handle the pain by yourself. God never intended for you to handle the pain by yourself. First, the Bible says God draws us close to himself, and then here's the second thing, write this down. God grieves with us. God grieves with us. Now, the the reason you have the ability to grieve is because you are made in God's image. You're not an animal. Animals, a, 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 a flea doesn't grieve, and a cow doesn't grieve, and birds don't grieve, and snails and whales don't grieve, but human beings grieve, why? Because we're made in the image of God. The only reason you have any emotion at all is because God is an emotional God. The Bible tells us that God grieves. The Bible tells us that God weeps. When he sees inhumanity on earth, he weeps. When God sees a sin, he weeps. When God sees wars destroying people, when God sees his planet being destroyed, God weeps, God grieves. And we're made in God's image, and the Bible says God weeps with us. In other words, he's, God is a suffering God, and God is a sympathetic God. He's not aloof, he's not apathetic, he's standing, not standing on the sidelines, he suffers with us. Look at this verse up here on the screen. Isaiah 53, verse three says this. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Have you ever seen that verse? Jesus, it's out of Isaiah, it's prophecy, was a man of sorrows acquainted with bitterest grief. He knew suffering firsthand. So when you come to Jesus, it's not like Jesus goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. When your heart is breaking and you're in pain, it's not like Jesus going, I don't understand it, I don't get that, just buck up and put on a happy face. No, Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted 
with grief. Let me just give you one example. There on your outline, when his friend Lazarus died, the Bible says in John 11, when Jesus saw Lazarus' sister sobbing, and he saw how all those with, all those with, were, he, he was, were crying also, his heart was touched, and he was deeply moved. Then Jesus started crying. See how much he loved Lazarus, they say. Circle the word love. You know, I told you that, that, that grief is actually an evidence of love. And the more you love, the more you're gonna grieve about things. If you're apathetic, if you're callous, you don't have any love in your life, you don't care what happens to anybody else, it doesn't bother you. You don't grieve about the tragedy of your next door neighbor. If you don't love them, you don't care. The more you love, the more you're gonna understand grief. And it says Jesus started crying. You know the shortest verse in the Bible is John 11:35. 35. It's two words, Jesus wept. John 11, 35, that's your memory verse for the week, okay? Everybody can do that, let's say it. John 11, 35, and what did it say? Jesus wept, and where is that? John 11, 35, that's the shortest verse in the Bible, you just memorized a Bible verse. It's only two words, Jesus wept, but what does it say? It says we have a suffering God, we have a God who sympathizes, who understands, who knows us. And the Bible says, Jesus started crying. Now let me just say to the guys, guys, we're not very good at grief. It's not a macho thing. We don't like negative feelings. Men don't like to feel negative. They don't like bad things. They don't, certainly don't like sorrow. And we're taught uh, growing up, you know, in fact, parents, you need to stop teaching your kid to stuff their emotions. Because one of the first things parents did, stop your crying, stop your crying, stop your crying. Really? You, is that what you really want? You want to teach people to stuff their emotions? The Bible says Jesus started crying. Sadness is not weakness. Jesus was the strongest man who ever lived. A, a, a showing, a, for a man to show emotion is not a sign of weakness, it's actually a sign of strength. Weak men are scared of their emotions. Weak men are afraid of tears. It freaks them out. They go nutty, why? Because it scares them. When you're a strong man, you're not afraid of emotion. You're not afraid to show it. You're not even afraid to cry. Jesus was the strongest man who ever lived. So never be embarrassed, never be embarrassed by tears. In fact, the Bible says Jesus was sent to comfort us. Look at this, Isaiah 61, verse two and three. The Bible says, he has sent me, Jesus, to comfort all who mourn, to give those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief and a song of praise instead of sorrow. So, the first two ways that God blesses a broken heart is he draws us close to himself. He says, I'm gonna be with you. You're not gonna go through this on your own. And number two, I'm gonna feel it with you. The pain you feel in that separation, God feels it. The pain you feel in that loneliness, God feels it. The pain you feel in that rejection, God feels it. The pain you feel in that embarrassment, that disgrace, God feels it. He is with you and he is feeling it with you. Now there's a third thing that God does in blessing our broken hearts, and that is this. God gives us a church family for support. God never meant for you to go through life on your own. And God says, I didn't intend for you to go through grief. You know, it, the old statement that when you share a joy, it's doubled, and when you share a sorrow, it's halved. When you carry it all yourself, you're carrying a load that God never intended for you to have. When something bad happens to you and you say, I'm not gonna tell anybody about this, I'm gonna keep it a secret, I'm gonna keep it to myself, you have just broken one of the principles of God's word. God says we're meant to grieve in community. We, healing comes in groups. Healing comes in the church. Healing comes in community. We're better together. You weren't meant to carry it on your own. Look at this verse, Romans 12, 5, 10, and 15. Three verses in Romans chapter 12. 
In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Now, th these are commands, and if you call yourself a follower of Christ, they're commanded for you. In Christ, we form one body. That's the church. The church is the family of God, and it's the body of Christ. And the Bible says each member belongs to all the others. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but you could turn to the people on either side and say, you belong to me. You might have a few marriage proposals, but um, <laughs> we belong to each other. We are brothers and sisters in God's family. We're part of the body of Christ. And then it says we are to be devoted to each other like a loving family. And how, do we, how are we devoted? We sympathize with each other. When you have a victory, I shouldn't be jealous. I should celebrate your success. And when you have a defeat, I shouldn't gloat over that. I should mourn with those who mourn. Now, I'm not going to go into this because you've heard me talk about it a thousand times, but you need a small group. If you don't have a small group, you have no safety net when the rogue winds come. I would not be standing before you today if it weren't for my small group. My small group, the one I've been in 11 years, walked me through this last year when my son took his life. My small group was there in the darkest days of my life. They were there just being the ministry of presence. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to give me any advice. They just showed up. Who are you doing that for? Who knows that you would show up in their crisis? And who has that same kind of commitment to you? You need to get in a small group. And Saddleback has you know, now 8,000 plus small groups. And we actually have specialized support groups for every kind of crisis you can imagine. You name a crisis that people go through, we've got a support group for it. There is no reason at all for you to go through the pain on your own. It's just your own pride that will keep you from getting involved in the support. The Bible says God gives us a church family for support. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, comfort each other and give each other strength. Now let me give you a couple suggestions because right now, you're in one of two positions. You're either going through pain yourself and you need comfort, or you're not going through pain and you need to comfort others. You either need comfort or you need to be comforted. You need to be comforted or you need to be a comforter. You either need help or you need to help. Either way, this is a message that you need to be using. If you're not in major pain right now, you need to be thinking, how can I follow what Jesus tells me to do and comfort the people in pain around me? Well, first you gotta be aware. And if you care, you'll be aware. There are people in pain sitting on your row and you don't even know what their pain is. If you care, you'll be aware. Let me give you two suggestions for comforting people when they go through any kind of loss, financial loss, physical loss, health loss, loss of a loved one or anything. Let me just give you two, write these down. Uh, number one, never minimize another's pain, the pain of others. Never minimize others' pain. Kay was talking the other day, we were in London, and she was speaking and she said, one of the words you can delete from your vocabulary when you're talking to somebody in pain is the word at least. And she told me about a, a, a lady, a mother, who had lost a child through drowning. And a neighbor came over and in a meaningful attempt to comfort said, well, at least you're young enough to have another child. Are you kidding me? I'm sure that mama said, I'm not wanting another child. I want my child back. I want my child back. Don't tell me, well, at least you've got three other kids. Are you kidding me? Well, at least you've got your, eliminate the phrase at least from your vocabulary when talking to somebody in pain. It doesn't help. It's not, you're trying to minimize the pain by pointing out something good. Just never minimize the pain of others. And, and I would say again, parents, stop trying to teach your kids to stuff it. Don't cry now. You know, the typical reaction when somebody's in pain, we try to fix it immediately. Don't be in a hurry to fix anything. You don't need to fix it, God will fix it. 
in due time. What you need to do is just be there and be aware and care. So never minimize. The other thing is never rush people. Never rush people. Pain and grief takes time. And nobody can figure out how long the grief's gonna take for any particular thing in your life but you. I can't tell you what's the appropriate time to grieve for anything in your life. You're just gonna have to figure that one out yourself. And it's different for everybody else. You know, in marriages, the death of a child is often the predictor of a divorce. In fact, marriages that have the death of a child don't have a pretty good rate of staying together. Kay and I knew that statistic. And when Matthew died, we determined that we were going to let this draw us closer to each other rather than divide us. And it was all because of one thing, showing grace to each other and realizing whatever you're feeling right now is okay. And I don't try to talk Kay out of her feelings, she doesn't try to talk me out of mine, and we just enter into each other's pain. A feeling is neither right or wrong, it's just a feeling. Let me say that one again. A feeling is never right or wrong, it's just a feeling. So husbands, tr quit trying to talk your wife out of feelings. And wives, quit trying to talk your husbands out of feelings. Feeling is neither right nor wrong, it's just a feeling. And, and so you show grace to each other and you, you never rush people. Kay wrote a column, uh, our little uh, post in Facebook a couple weeks ago about how she was starting to feel people kind of rushing her and saying, you know, when are you gonna go back to teaching? And you know, when are you gonna be back on the stage? And, and, you know, and, and, and kind of like, aren't you over it yet? And, and, and she st stopped trying to push people to get over it. She wrote this little post, did it hit a nerve? Over three million people reposted it. Why? Because that's the way anybody who in deep pain feels. They understand. Don't tell me to get over it. You don't get over it, you get through it. You get through it. So God gives us a family, and we're not to minimize and we're not to rush the people in our lives. There's a fourth way that God blesses broken hearts. All right? He, he gives us a church family, he gives us his own presence, he grieves with us. Number four, God uses grief to help us grow. God uses grief, God uses pain even, to help us grow. And he does it in three ways. Here are three verses that illustrate three different ways. First, God uses pain to get our attention. C.S. Lewis wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone. Pain is saying, hello! We rarely change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 20, verse 30. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. That's in the today's English version. Anybody agree with that verse? Yeah, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. So God uses grief to help us grow by getting our attention. Second way, he brings good out of bad. One of the most famous verses in the Bible is Romans 8, 28. We know, we know, not guess, not hope, we know that in all things, not some, not just the good, in all things, God works. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It's an opportunity to grow in character. Every time you go through pain, you, don't, you can't control the pain you go through. You may have chronic pain, and that pain may be with you for years and years and years. You can't always control that, but you can decide whether it's gonna make you bitter or better, whether it's gonna be a stepping stone or it's gonna be a stumbling block. God brings good out of bad. And the third thing he does is he prepares us for eternity. Look at this next verse. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. These troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory. What troubles? The pain you're going through right now. These troubles, that sickness, that sadness, that suffering, that lack, that loss, that pain, that pressure, that problem, these troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory that will make all our troubles seem like, like nothing. 
like nothing. Things that are seen don't last forever, but things that are not seen are eternal. And that's why we keep focused on the things that can't be seen. You've heard me say before, you're not taking your car to heaven, you're not taking your china to heaven, you're not taking your clothes to heaven, you're not taking your career to heaven, but you are taking your character. You're taking you. And so God's more interested in your character development than in your comfort. Why? Because comfort's gonna be on for trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of years in heaven. This is the get ready stage, this is the learning stage, this is the warm up act, this is the school, it's a preschool. And God says, these troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory. That's a comfort. You see, studies have shown that the people who were in the concentration camps in World War II, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau, all these countries, that many died, but some survived. And those that survived found meaning and purpose in their pain that those who saw no meaning or purpose gave up. You see, you can handle an enormous amount of pain when you can realize there's a good purpose in it, like labor and having a baby. But when you don't see any purpose in the pain, then it's easy to give up. When the pain is unceasing, when the pain never stops, when the pain keeps going, you need to see God's purpose. And what is God doing? First, is he trying to get my attention? Second, is he trying to bring good out of bad? Third, is he preparing my character for heaven? Is he giving me an opportunity to grow in Christ's likeness? Things that are seen don't last forever, but things that are not seen are eternal. Number five, the fifth way that God comforts us when we mourn is that God gives us the hope of heaven. And this one has been particularly beautiful and meaningful to me this last year, that this life is not all there is, that this is just the warm-up act, and that we're living for so much more. The amount of time you're going to spend on earth is really quite small. You're only going to get 80, 90, at the most, maybe 100 years. That's nothing, nothing. It's going to be over before you realize it. It's nothing compared to millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years in heaven. And the Bible says we have the hope of heaven. If there were no hope of heaven, I would be in despair. Because there's just too much bad in the world. There are too many rapes. Too many people getting molested. Too many children being abused. Too many wars. Too many people having being tortured, too many people being burned up by, by chemicals and all kinds of things. But the fact is, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, talking about believers who die. Paul says, we don't want you to be ignorant about believers who've died. We don't want you to grieve like the people who have no hope. Circle the people who have no hope. There's two kinds of grief. You can grieve with hope, or you can grieve without hope. Let me tell you, you want the first one. As a pastor, I have done, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds I don't know, maybe thousands. I don't know how many funerals that I've, I've done. I don't know how many times I've stood at the bedside of somebody taking their last breath. I have been at the funerals and looked in the faces of people who had no hope when a loved one died. And I've seen the terror on their face and the despair on their face. You see, the test of your faith, the test of your belief system, the test of your worldview is not how you handle the parties of life. The test of your worldview is how you handle the failures and how you handle the funerals and how you handle the deaths of life. That's the acid test. The Bible says we have a hope. And so we grieve, but we grieve with hope. When a Christian dies, why do we grieve? I mean, the, that Christian is going to heaven. They're going where they're made for. They're going where they're going to spend eternity. And they're going where you're going to go too if you know the Lord. So why do we grieve? We're not grieving them in a funeral. We're grieving us. We miss them. We're not grieving them. 
My son Matthew for 27 years was tortured by mental illness and it was agony. And honestly, when he died, I grieved his extremely painful life more than I grieved his extremely painful death. Because I know today he has no fear, he has no pain, he has no depression, he has, he is, every one of his questions has been answered. He has joy, he has the understanding, everything he's always wanted. Why was I made like this? Why didn't, why didn't I get well? All those questions were answered. I'm not grieving the fact that he's in heaven. I grieve the fact that I miss him. I want my son back. I miss him now. And so when a Christian grieves, we grieve in a very, very different way than the rest of the world. We grieve with hope. Non-believers grieve without any hope. And that's disastrous. It's devastating. It's debilitating. It's despairing. What is our hope? Revelation 21 verse four says this. God will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. I am looking forward to that day so much. It's one of the things that allows me to go to places like Africa and see people starving from poverty and allows me to go into the inner city and see people being beat up and abused and misused and allows me to see all the pain in the world which could be debilitating in its depressing nature. If I didn't know that one day God is gonna settle the score, he's gonna even the odds, he's gonna balance the accounts, and one day in heaven, God's gonna wipe away every tear and there will be no more death and there will be no more mourning and there will be no more suffering and no more crying and no more pain for the old order will have passed away. That is one of the six hopes that blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Finally, there's one more thing and this is a big one. God uses our pain to help others. There's a purpose in your pain. This is called redemptive pain. This is the highest and best use of the pain you go through. God does not want you to waste a hurt. God never wastes a hurt, but we often do because we're not willing to use it to help other people. God uses our pain to help others. This is the highest and best use. Who can better help the mother of a special needs child? than another mother of a special needs child? Who can better help somebody who's lost a son or daughter in a war than somebody who lost a son or daughter in a war? Who can better help somebody who lost a limb than somebody who's lost a limb? Who could better help somebody who has gone through the pain of an addiction or a marriage failure or a molestation or any of the other evils in the world than somebody who went through that. God does not want you to waste your hurt. This is redemptive hurt. He wants you to redirect your focus. Second Corinthians 1, 4. God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we receive from God. Now listen very closely. Your greatest ministry will come out of your deepest hurt. Your, my, you might write this down. My greatest ministry will come out of my deepest hurt. Because you can relate. You can say, been there, done that, went through. I had a mother who was abusive. I had a dad who was distant and left the family. I had a, a, a failure in this area or that area. Your greatest ministry will come out of your deepest hurt. You see, we think the world is impressed by how we handle prosperity, but the world is actually impressed by how we handle adversity. We think that it is our success that gives us credibility to be a witness, but God says no, it is our suffering that gives us credibility. 
You would not believe the open doors that have happened in my life since Matthew died. And when I began to journal about it on social media, people began to come out of the woodwork and some people you wouldn't believe and said, I've never told this to anybody else. We think that fame earns respect, but actually it's faithfulness in tough times. And here's the bottom line. I'll say it again. We're in a broken world, and so every day nothing works perfectly. And that means every day you need to be either, you either need comfort or you need to comfort others. Right now, you're in one of two categories. Put yourself on it. Right now, you either need help because you're in really bad pain or you need to help others. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to do both at the same time. It's called being a wounded healer. If you wait until you're completely healed to help other people, guess what? You're gonna wait a long time because you're not gonna be fully healed of everything in your life until you get to heaven. 